Good morning, church family. A couple of memorials that are coming up that we just want to inform you about. The first one is April 17th at noon. We are going to be celebrating the life of Jerry Cox. We want to invite you to come out and to celebrate his great life, his ministry, his influence in our church. Come out that Saturday. And then the following Saturday, April 24th, at 11 a.m., we are going to be celebrating the life of Tim Rose. Tim Rose went home to be with the Lord a few months ago, and he was a drummer in our church, and we love him, and we're gonna be celebrating his life. And so come on out on these two Saturdays, and we'll celebrate the lives of these great men. Good morning, Emmanuel. Pastor Matt here. I just wanna let you know about Action Day Camp that is coming up June 21st to the 25th. You can sign your kids up now at eflint.org slash actiondaycamp. The cost is $65 until Mother's Day and then after Mother's Day it's $75. So get registered before Mother's Day so you get that special discount. It's for kids coming out of kindergarten through fifth grade. So go sign up eflint.org slash action day. Hey everybody, Pastor Ross here. Hey, next Sunday, Blake Ann is actually coming here to our church and they're gonna put on an event for our teens from 4 p.m. until 9 p.m. Ken Rudolph's gonna speak. Our worship team is gonna play uh, Lake Inn. Elliot's coming down to run games. It's gonna be a fantastic time. We've got other youth groups coming. So make plans next Sunday, four to nine. Lake Inn will be here. Hey, I'm Wes. And I'm Emmeline. And we actually are part of the Life Group and excited because we've actually created a family and some sort of a, just a bond with our Life Group. And we really wanna be able to see you at, in a Life Group and uh, the way to do that is sign up online at eflint.org. Thank you. Hey everybody, Pastor Dan here. Just want to remind you about our Discover Emmanuel class beginning April 18th. If you're interested in joining the church, learning about what we believe, our philosophy of ministry, how we function, you won't want to miss Discover Emmanuel. We have an opportunity for you to join at 9.30 and at 11.15. Make sure to sign up at the back ministry table for your spot starting April 18th. Hey everyone, Pastor Dan again. I want to tell you about our Connections Lunch today after the 1115 gathering. You won't want to miss this opportunity to have a free lunch and to meet the team, ask questions, learn a little bit more about us. We'll see you there.
All right, good morning, church. It's good to see everybody here today. The Bible says in Psalm 98, Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp and the harp and the sound of singing. With trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord for he comes to judge the earth, he will judge the world in righteousness and the people with equity. Let's bow and praise our great God together today. Lord, we love you so much and we're grateful to be gathered again on a Sunday, Lord, to remember you overcoming sin and death. Even though last Sunday was Easter, every Sunday in essence is Easter as we celebrate who you are and what you did on the cross and overcoming sin and death through the resurrection. And God, we just pray today that we be able to sing with joyful hearts. We pray today that we be challenged in your word. God, we pray today that this would be a special time of reflection of all that you are and all that you've done. We praise you. We love you. For it's in your precious name, the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand together and we'll worship our great God. sings and round me rings the beauty of the spheres this is my father's world i rest me in the thought of rocks and trees of skies and seas his and the wonders wrong this is my father's world the birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my Father's world, He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear Him pass, He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world, oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world, the battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. Amen. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall 
Glad that you're all here with us, and we thank you for a good week that we had. Friday, there were 30 of you that came and gave your blood. We thank you for that. So take note of the things that are happening this week and be a part of them. For you that are our guests, take your connections card or go to our app and download it at, at uh, eflint.org, and you'll find more information there as well as the devotionals for each day. Your offering, place them in the offering boxes. And our prayer time, put those on the back of the connection cards and we will pray for them. Still have some folks that aren't feeling good, some families that have lost loved ones, so keep them in your prayers. Father, we're grateful to be in the house of the Lord again today. We look forward to sharing together in singing and as pastor opens up the word of God again. We need that encouragement. The world is in dire need of a voice of hope and encouragement. And that comes in the person of Jesus Christ. And we're thankful that he's the one we proclaim. So may today be a great day. May all of those in our church family who have special needs, may you minister to them. Some have lost loved ones. Encourage them. Some are still sick. Give them the healing that they need. And give us a great time as we continue to worship in song and then the word of God. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart. Shelter like no other, your name. Let the nation sing it louder. Cause nothing has the power to say. Is the 
run to your name, Jesus. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper. Through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. Come on back. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the you deserve, the one we can pour, all I have is yours, every single breath, I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you you search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord. Amen. Perfect song for uh, the message today. If you have your Bibles, open them with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Good to see everybody here today. A couple uh, things before we get started today. Um, this, this Saturday, we're going to celebrate the life of dear Jerry Cox. Please make sure that you are here Saturday. It's going to be a special time as we celebrate his life. Um, and uh, we will... Think through and, and share some things in the Word of God just about Jerry and 
be a special time. So make sure that you're here Saturday for that. And uh, that will take place at noon. So make sure that you're here. Also, um, just a little housekeeping. And uh, it's, it's always great when people are, are gathering and enjoying our church as members and more importantly as partners. And so Avery Morgan, the young man on the back, go ahead and wave. You guys can look at Morgan or look at um, Avery. And Kate Haw. Kate, where are you at? They are coming to, to join our church as members and, more importantly, as partners. And we already have them involved, as you can see. And so if you're excited for them to join and be a part of our church, say amen. amen. And they are a part of our church. Now we praise God for that reality. And there are others at 11 and 15 that will be um, joining as well. Matthew chapter number 6, we'll get there in just a few moments. Several years ago, I had just an incredible privilege of um, celebrating my parents' 35th anniversary. And so we decided, my sister and my brother and I, we decided that we were going to throw my parents a surprise birthday party, and we decided we were going to have that, or or a surprise anniversary party. We decided we were going to have that anniversary um, at my church that I grew up in, Warren, Michigan. And so we got everyone kind of together in, in, in creating the plan and organizing it and all these things. Well, at the time, my brother was living in South Carolina with his uh, soon-to-be, his wife uh, and her family. So he was with, living with the family. He was finishing up school and different things like that. And so I had gotten a hold of him, and I said, hey, you know, we're going to throw this anniversary party for mom and dad. And he's like, yeah, I'm all in. And so I remembered, uh, you know, he flew into Detroit Metro Airport. I went and picked him up and everything, and it was perfect. So the day of the anniversary party came, and my sister pretended to, you know, have something wrong with her car, and she's in the church parking lot. My dad had to come and bail her out, and my dad was in such a bad mood. It was hilarious, right? He's like, why do I have to do this? You're always, you know, messing up with your car and all these kinds of things, you know, so he's frustrated. But as it goes, you know, he, he gets there, and he's helping her out, and my sister's like, well, let's, let's go in the church for a minute, you know, and whatever. So he goes into the church, you know, and then they walk into the, the room, and surprise, it's this big celebration, and they were, they were shocked. Well, the, the celebration was incredible because the surprise within the surprise was that we, we still pretended that my brother was not there. And so we're in the room and everything, and, and I'm like, well, let's, let's call Josh, my brother. Let's call Josh, you know, in, uh, in South Carolina. So he was in another room in the church at the time. And so I, I call my brother. He gets on the phone. I'm like, Josh, we have you on speakerphone. You know, he's like, well, what's going on? I'm like, it's mom and dad's anniversary. He's like, oh, yeah, that's right. It's their anniversary and everything. And, and they were like listening to it, and, and we're talking through it. He's like, mom, dad, happy anniversary. He's like, oh, we miss you, Josh. It's so awesome that you would be able to talk to us, and we miss you, and this whole experience. So we get off the phone. We're going through the party, doing some different things. We walk out of the room. I do, and I walk back in, and we decided that we were going to throw a skit, a little skit. Now, my parents, I mentioned this to you. My parents, uh, you know, grew up in the 60s, and they were flower power children and uh, hippies and all that good stuff. So I walked back in, and I had a T-shirt on, you know, and a shirt over it, and it was kind of down and, you know, with a, a wig over my head and a bandana, you know, and I'm playing this whole role as a, as a hippie, and I walk in and everything, and, and my parents are laughing. It's this really funny moment. Well, a few moments later, and you really probably couldn't do this in this day and age anymore, but a few moments later, we had decided that my brother was going to be a part of the skit. I was playing the role of my dad, and my brother would play the role of my mom. So my brother had a wig on, and he's dressed up like a female, and you can't really do that in today's day and age. At least you shouldn't do that in this day and age. So anyway, he walks in, like, uh, you know, like playing the part of my mom, and we're doing this whole skit, and you should have saw the look on my mom and dad on their face. My mom looks at him, and she's like, who is that? What's going on? And then she realizes that it's my brother, and the tears began to stream down her face, and she got up from where she was sitting, and she walked up, and she grabbed my brother and hugged him, and it was the most, one of the most amazing moments. I'll never forget that moment. Just an incredible moment. We had, we had pulled this joke on my mom and dad, this surprise, and we surprised him with a party, and then we fully surprised him with my brother being at the party when he was supposed to be in South Carolina. 
In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus preaches what's called the Sermon on the Mount, covering several days, where he is attempting to expose the self-righteous lifestyles of the insincere outward religious leaders of that day. He challenged the common person in the text to understand that the kingdom of God is not made up of outward prosperity. It's not made up of empty rituals, but it's made up of inward sincerity and faithful obedience. In his latest sermon here in chapter 6, in today's focus, puts a person's motivations on trial. And just like my brother, you can pull a fast one on someone, deceiving someone for a while, but eventually the truth comes out. In that moment, my mom was fully deceived, but it didn't take long before she realized what was going on. And for us this morning, I want us to really think and understand and really evaluate where we are in our lives when it comes to our motivations, when it comes to how we view something and why we do what we do. Not just that we're doing it, but the reason behind why we're doing it. And if I was to give you a big idea this morning, it would be simply this. Living in a superficial world, authentic disciples, they deflect attention to the way maker, to Jesus. They deflect attention to Christ. They do not accept it for themselves, but they deflect it to Jesus Christ. And for us, we want to take a deep dive into our motivations and our feelings and our reactions to really attention pursuits. Are we in a place where we find ourselves seeking attention? So this morning I want to give to you the checklist of superficial motivations that a mature disciple will avoid. Now remember in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, Jesus was warning about superficial righteousness. He says in verse 20, For I tell you that unless your righteousness, and he's talking to the crowds, and he's saying this in a positive sense, your righteousness being pure motivations. Now at times he talked about your righteousness, quote unquote, in terms of superficial righteousness. But here he's speaking of pure motivations. Unless this surpasses, it goes beyond pharisaical externals. Unless it surpasses that of the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So he lays that groundwork in chapter 5, and he gives us illustrations of this in chapter 6. Now I tell you again this morning, your Christian activity is failing its purpose if it's drawing people to you away from God. That's the text, that's the idea. So this morning, the checklist of superficial motivations, the first one is simply this, self-recognition, self-recognition. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1, Jesus said this, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Now, verse 1 is the focus of the entire chapter here you're going to see or the section that we're going to look at. He lays the groundwork here. If you're doing this to be seen of others, then you're not right. Then you're not going to receive a reward, or the reward that you are going to receive is limited. Now he gives us the first illustration of this. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites, the stage players, the actors do, in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, now remember, when Jesus says truly I tell you, he's saying verily, verily, or he's saying this is a guarantee. We, we preached on this several months ago, the idea of the amen, in Jesus' name, amen. When you say amen, it's so be it. This is supposed to happen. And when Jesus said this, he's guaranteeing it. So he says this, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And some translations say will reward you openly. So self-recognition, be motivated in service to glorify God and not yourself. That's the theme of this message this morning. Now he gives an illustration right away that I think is important for us to see. You can do something good. But you can have the wrong motivations, and what does it do? It taints what you're attempting to do. It really does. I think sometimes as um, 
as spouses, right? You know, my wife can make my favorite meal, just an incredible meal. She can make me like, um, well, my favorite meal is pizza, you know that. But like, it could be like, you know, like the steak and gravy and mashed potatoes, and it's really good, and she makes that for me. And then afterwards, you know, it's like, okay, can we go shopping now? <laughs> it's like that was the motivation behind it. It's like when your kids, they, they come up to you, and dad, you're so beautiful, and one, well, not beautiful, they wouldn't say I'm beautiful, that would be weird, but anyway, maybe to their mother. But anyway, they say, you know what, I love you, and, and you're the greatest dad in the whole world, and I, you're, I'm so lucky to have you as my father, and they say something like that. What's going to be your reaction to that? What are you going to say to them next? How much, right? How much, you know? Well, how, much do you, how much do you want? Why are you saying what you're saying, right? I, you know, I use this illustration. It may make some of you uncomfortable, but, you know, guys, you put your arm around your wife, you know, and your wife looks at you, and she's like, oh, you want to cuddle. And you're like, no. I had something else in mind, okay? And she's like, whoa, you know? And so your, your motivations are like, they're, they're based on what you're, you're doing something good, but you're doing something good for a reason that's not authentic or genuine or transparent or real. And so in the end, it taints the accomplishment. Jesus gives illustrations of this. He's given the illustration, first of all, of Jewish almsgiving. It was a long-standing tradition in that time period to show mercy to the poor by meeting their needs. And so Jesus assumed by the way that the disciples, and you're going to notice this in all three illustrations, he, he assumed that the disciples would participate in this. That's why he says, when you do this, he's not saying if you do this, when you do this, you are going to give to the poor. That's what you do. That's part of being a Christian. That's what he's saying, right? In this expected service. But why are you doing it? What's the motivation behind it? In that time period, public fasts, were proclaimed by the actual sounding of trumpets. And at such times, prayers often for rain. So people were desiring rain to be able to help their crops to grow, those kinds of things, those kinds of reasons. At such times, prayers for rain were recited in the streets. And it was widely thought in that time period that almsgiving, giving to the poor, ensured the efficacy or the power behind those fasts and those prayers. So people would pray They would pray, they would give to get. But that's not the very thing that Jesus teaches here. We don't give to get. It's the wrong mentality. What is Jesus doing here then? He's unmasking this sense of understanding, this sense of wrong thinking or behavior. And he's he's condemning people who are always attention getters for their own Good. Matter of fact, the Bible says that he calls them hypocrites. We already mentioned this. This this word hypocrite in the language is the idea of an actor or a stage player or a pretender. Not because, by the way, of their imperfections. Because we all have issues. We all have imperfections. We pretend as if we do not. We are are failing to be genuine and, and authentic and transparent. But it's because they're using their religion, in essence, to cover up their sins while promoting themselves. That's what the religious leaders were doing in that day. And Jesus condemns this kind of behavior. This last week I had just a great privilege of having lunch with a young man in our church. And I sat down with him when we were speaking. He said, Pastor John, you know one of the things that means the most to me here at Emmanuel? I said, what? He said, here's, here's the thing, man. I love the fact that when I come to Emmanuel, I can share my struggles and issues with people. And I found that people will share their struggles and issues too. And he's like, I've been in churches before. Everyone acts like they're perfect, like they have no issues. And he's like, man, I, I've been in those situations, and, and I know that people have issues. I know they do, but when I don't hear them talk about it or share about it or be transparent or honest or, or, or real about it, then what happens for me, I get discouraged with myself. And I think, man, there's really something wrong with me. He said, man, that's, man, that's so different here at Emmanuel. Emmanuel, the people here are, are willing to be honest and, and transparent. And I thought, man, that's a powerful illustration of the opposite of what Jesus is speaking of here. Self-recognition, it leads to devastating results. It leads to a few different things. And I think this is profound that we need to see. And Jesus speaks of this multiple times here 
in these different illustrations. He says, this person, I tell you the truth, they have their reward in full. He's talking about the devastating results here of stunted influence. This is the kind of person who plays to the crowd and they get the applause of men. But once they get the applause of men, shoo, it's over. That's it. That's all they get. That's what he's talking about here. And I think about it in my own life, man, I don't want to be that, right? I want to be the kind of person that gives the glory to God, that serves the Lord, that honors God, that's involved in ministry for God. And, and maybe God gives me the opportunity to influence a brother in Christ and he gets saved and he's impacted. And my motivation is glory of God, Jesus, not about me, about Jesus. And then here's what happens. This person then goes and impacts this person and this person. Man, maybe their kid goes to the mission field and they're leading people to Christ. Maybe one of their other kids is in the business world and he gives money toward some sort of thing in the church and it allows people to be saved. And then it leads to, over here, these people being impacted by Jesus. And here's what's going on. It's called the invisible beauty of God working. You're, you're not going to see it. You may never see it. But here's the thing you can be guaranteed of. It's taking place when God gets the glory. When it's about you. When you do what you do for yourself and for your own attention and for you. What does Jesus say? Oh, people are going to praise you. They're going to tell you how great you are. And shoot, that's where it ends right there. That's it. It ends right there. Man, that is profound to me. When I was studying this this week, thinking about this, it's stunted influence. You want the applause. It's like Jesus is saying, you want the applause of men? Okay, you can have the applause of men. That's where it ends. <sighs> Who wants that? Nobody should, Right? We focus on Jesus. God's going to be doing things all around. It's the invisible glory of God. And you may never see it until you get to heaven. But here's the thing you have to understand. It's happening. It's happening. There's also not just stunted influence, but there's empty religion. Empty religion. Luke chapter 11, verse 37. Look at this on the screen if you would. Here's going to be an example of this. You guys have the verses. Luke chapter 11. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and he reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish. But inside you are full of greed and wickedness, you foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now... As for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. You see, when God gets the glory, you are a part of his story. We have to understand this. That's the reality of what God is doing in your life, in my life. And then activity without love is man-made religion that kills influence. It really does. The illustration Jesus gives here is of the Pharisees that made a public display of their ceremonial washings. Now, they were making a man-made application of Leviticus 11, 31 through 38. In that time period, the religious leaders and the Jews, they would ceremonially wash themselves before they would eat in, in different things. And a lot of it had to do with, like, they considered themselves unclean if they had any sort of association with Gentiles and other various reasons. But they had added to the law and they made themselves righteous and they were so concerned about making sure their hands were washed and clean. And Jesus says, man, you're so focused on being outwardly clean, but on the inside, in essence, you're full of dead man's bones. He's saying, listen, on the inside, you're taking advantage of people. Like you want everyone to think you look a certain way and you are a certain way, but in context of the illustration here, In Luke 11, these people, they were being stingy with giving to the poor. And Jesus is like, man, give to the poor and care for people. That's more important than having your hands washed. That's why activity without love is man-made religion. What, What is the thing that really motivates our focus? And how can you kill this area of self recognition Well, it's very clear, I think, for us this morning. God's will and glory has to be at the forefront of everything that we do. I love what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 5 when he said this, and they exceeded our expectations. Talking about the Macedonian churches of Philippi 
Berea and Thessalonica. And they gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. You see, they gave outwardly, but it was from the drive from within their relationship with Christ. And so, how do you kill self-recognition? Well, you give immediately when you're prompted by God, leading to less focus on yourself and more focus on others. You see, that's the illustration now, if you look back in the text that he gives to us. Verse 3, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You see, it's this idea of, of, of being driven by the glory of God and the encouragement that we can give to others. And we have to give when we're guaranteed to get no recognition. That is how we know that our motivations are pure. Are we serving? Are we giving? When we know no one's going to recognize it, when no one's going to give us any credit or attention, that is the drive that we should have when it comes to giving, when it comes to serving, when it comes to influencing, when we know that other people are not going to notice it. You know, we live in a culture today that's driven by self-recognition, though. We really do. I was reading this this week. Now, I don't actually have an Instagram. Many of you probably don't. Some of you probably do. Um, but on Instagram, there's this thing called Managergram, where you can literally buy Instagram followers. If you spend a certain amount of money, they help you to get followers. And people, and I don't know how that works exactly, you know. I don't know how it works. But I, the highest, the platinum number is like 120 bucks, and you can get all these followers. I don't know what they do if they bribe people. I don't know how they get you more followers. But, and I, I thought about it. It was social media. Well, think about it, whether it's Instagram or, or Facebook or Twitter or whatever, right? It's always picture-driven or post-driven or product-driven or presentation-driven. And what it is, it's, it's self-recognition. I'm not saying we shouldn't be on social media, but I'm just saying pay attention to it sometimes. It really is about self-recognition. So how do you kill self-recognition? How do you do this? You understand that I'm going to serve God when nobody else is going to pay attention to it. The other thing that you do is you have a forgetful memory, we read the example. Jesus gives this illustration, the right hand and the left hand. It's an incredible illustration that we should forget what we've done. We should just move forward, and it's not something that we're dwelling on. I came across this graphic this week. I thought it was pretty funny. Notice this. When a man says he'll do anything for a woman, he means fight bad guys and kill dragons. He doesn't mean to vacuum or wash dishes, okay? <laughs> Honey, I will do anything for you. Well, just put your clothes away. No, I can't do it. Okay? And that kind of translates then into guys, us forgetting, you know, we're going to forget to do things that we promise our wives. I promise you, honey, I'll do this. And then we don't do it and we forget. And it's easy to do it, right? My kids will tell me all the time, they'll say, well, you know, I forgot to I'll give them some chore. I forgot to do it. Well, I forgot to feed you today, I guess, you know. I forgot to pay your, your iPhone bill. Like, there's a lot of ways to look at that. And we fall into that place of forgetfulness. And most of the times, forgetfulness is a bad thing. But here, Jesus actually uses it to our advantage. He uses the illustration of the right hand. That's my left hand. The right hand and my left hand, right? The right hand and the left hand, the, the one should forget what the other has done. It, it should be... Man, they don't even know. The one doesn't even know what the other one's done. Now, what's the illustration of? The illustration is, of, man, you do it in such a way and so quickly with such speed that, man, it's almost like you forgot that you did it. Why? Because you're not motivated. You're not, it's not like you're posting something and waiting for people to praise you on it on Facebook. It's like, you know, you don't do something. You wait for someone to give you a call or, or notice you. No, you just keep moving. You keep moving. You do it with such speed. You do it with such secrecy. You do it in such a way to give honor to God. Why? Because religion manufactures attention to me, but relationship deflects attention to God. I love what Peter said in 1 Peter 1. He said, For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. That's... The glory of man, it's not going to be lasting. It's not going to be enduring. It was never intended to be. For us, if we are thirsting after people's praise in our service to God, then we're immature in our thinking, and we are, we are danger 
we are in danger of short-lived influence. And that's a, that's a serious thing for us to consider today. See, the problem is that it's not that what we're doing is wrong. It's why we're doing it is wrong. And Jesus is exposing the self-righteousness of the religious leaders. Now, number two, he gives us number two. Look in verse five. Number two is this, self-focus. Self-focus. Verse five says this. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray... Go into the inner room, go into the room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask it. We'll stop there for a minute. He's talking about making sure that your motivations are pure now in prayer, how you pray. It's, it's always interesting how, how God exposes us, too, when it comes to this. Be motivated to honor God. Be motivated to authentically worship. Be motivated to celebrate who God is. See, the dangerous reality in this is this. Just like giving, Jesus assumes that his followers are going to pray. That's what we do. We're followers of Jesus. We should be praying But again, it's not the action. It's the motivation behind the action that determines whether or not God is accepting it. Now we know there's all sorts of positions of prayer in the word of God. We know that in that time period, you went into a synagogue and you could pray. And it was something where people could go, specific people could go. And they could speak on different topics. And and prayer took place in the synagogue. We know that there was different positions of prayer as well. Matthew 26, a prayer where someone's prostrated before God. Acts chapter 7, where someone is kneeling before God. 2 Samuel 7, where someone is sitting before God. And then Mark 11, where you're actually standing before God. So it's not the posture that matters. It is the heart attitude in that prayer that matters. And I think it's important for us to to not be like many Christians who prostitute prayer. Say, wow, that's a powerful word. Why would you say that? Because... I've seen this over the years where Christians will prostitute prayer by showing off in their prayers, trying to get the attention of mankind. What's that about? Is there a certain way to pray? Are we trying to pray in in such a way to draw attention to ourselves? Because when we do, eventually we're going to be exposed. And we can have a self-righteous attitude in how we pray and how we view other people, but eventually it's going to be exposed. I have a funny illustration of that. I told you a few weeks ago that, well, I've I've told you a few times now that I have a little dog. His name is Buddy, right? He's the cutest little thing, and I've changed. God has changed my life. I love dogs now. It's an amazing thing. This little dog is great, but he always comes to me when it comes to eating because he is like the best begging dog I've ever seen in my life, right? He's this tiny little dog, and he'll jump up on the table, and his paws can barely get to the table, but he does this, and and we'll, we'll have just taken his bowl and put food in it and put it right there for him. But it's like he's looking at us like, I don't want dog food. I want people food. And in that moment, you're thinking like, just leave me alone. And I I told my wife the other day, go put him in the cage. He always comes to me. And she's like, man, it's because you're the weakest link. I know I'm the weakest link. I don't care. Go put him in the cage. And we're having this big argument. And it was incredible. She looks at me and she's like, notice how he never comes to me. And he never, never comes and begs to me. He never does it. And as the words were leaving her mouth, the Holy Spirit called that dog to move toward my wife. And little buddy jumped on Tammy and he's begging her for me. I'm like, yeah! You know, it was like this incredible moment. I'm like, you are exposed! You know, and you're like, why are you telling this story? I don't know. I just want to make sure you're awake, okay? So, it's kind of funny though, when we get to that place in our lives, and that's just a silly way to look at it, but when we get to that place in our lives where we are kind of being self-righteous, what does God do? He exposes us. And you're going to see that as we read on, and man, in this area of prayer, this is an area that we better have down. And when I say down, I don't mean praying a certain way. I mean having our hearts right with God. Having a disciplined prayer life. So there's postures and there's priorities that lead to maturity here. What are they? Well, first of all, the postures. And I would tell you this. 
your private prayer life should triple your public prayer life. Your private prayer life. Why? Because constant public prayer with little private prayer, it puts a person in danger of seeking man's approval. If you find yourself and you're up in front of people in a Bible study or at church or in a group and you're always publicly praying, but you're not involved ever in private prayer, then you're going to be in danger of doing it for the acceptance of mankind. The opposite is true. A life of constant private prayer puts a person in position to grow in intimacy with God. And I would tell you this, your, your private prayer life needs to triple your public prayer life. One of the most incredible things, I told you about that young man I met with last week. As we were sitting together, he continued the conversation, and he's really been battling in his marriage, I mean really bad, to the point of where he left his wife, and he was living with another woman. And he just had had enough with his wife, and it was over. And he said there was a day where he had to come see his wife, probably for logistical reasons, and he was sitting there with her talking over a couple things. And she said to him, she said, can I pray for you? And he was like, yeah, whatever, I don't care, you know. And she began to pray. Now listen to me. He said to me, he said, that was the moment where God changed my life. When I heard her praying in such a way to honor God, in such a way to love me, I was overwhelmed. The Holy Spirit convicted me deeply in that moment. And I realized that I needed to leave the woman that I was living with and come back home. Come back home and work on my marriage and make things right with God and do the right thing. And he said that was the moment where God really got a hold of my heart through that prayer, that public prayer of my wife. Now listen, this is the thing I'm going to tell you though. If you and I make the mistake into thinking that it was the public prayer that did the trick, so to speak, we're wrong. It was this young woman praying constantly on her knees when nobody's around, when nobody can see it. She's on her knees praying and begging God to fix her marriage, to get her husband's attention. All those things, it's the private prayer that gave the public prayer power. That's the reality of what God does. We have to get back to that place in our lives where we understand The battles are won and lost in your private prayer life. There's no showing off before God. It's just you and God. We'll tell you this as well. Your prayer life must be about simplicity and not sensationalism. See, Jesus is exposing here thoughtless prayers that are repetitive and drawn out. He says, you avoid those things. Why? Because prayer, listen to this, prayer is not about impressing the crowds or checking a a ritualistic box. That's not what it's about. It's about depending on God. Now, we've all heard it before, right? And maybe we've been guilty of it. Oh, thou, thou is Father in heaven, you are amazing. And we go through these prayers and we're like trying to one up the person that we're praying with. Like we want to make sure that our prayer sounds more holy and righteous and educated than the prayer of the person who just prayed. And it becomes a competition. And that's an abomination before God. And it's not what God would ever have us to live out. It's the impressing prayer. Then there's the lost and the checklist prayer. We pray because it's a checklist thing. We just got to mark it off and then we're praying. We're not even focused on what we're doing, but we lose track. Oh, did I pray for that person? Then we got to go back and we got to make sure we mark it off our checklist to say that we pray. That's not what God is looking for. You know, I've had several guys over the years, it's been a beautiful thing in my office that God has done the work, brought them to Jesus. And we get to that point of salvation, and I'll tell you, one thing that I never do, now I understand with children, it may be a little different, I'm not criticizing, one thing that I never do, I never lead someone through a prayer to be saved, never. I always tell them, listen, you want to be saved, you call out to Jesus to be saved. You know that you need Jesus alone to save you. You know that you're a sinner. You call out to Jesus. Pastor John, what should I pray? Listen, you need Christ, right? Yes. Call out to Jesus, Tell Jesus that you're a sinner and call out to Jesus and trust in him alone to save you and turn from your sin. And listen, you pray that prayer, and I don't pray this repeat after me prayer with adults. Now again, children could be different. I'm not being critical, but here's the thing. I've heard some of the most amazing, raw, authentic, beautiful prayers in my office that I've ever heard before because they'll say to me, well, how do you pray? You just talk to God. That's what prayer is. It's real. It's authentic. It's genuine. It's not about getting anybody's attention. It's not about putting on. What does Jesus say here? 
He says, make sure when you pray, it's authentic, it's real. It's not to be seen of mankind. Now he begins to give us what it should look like. And we could preach a whole message on this section, and that's not really my intention today, but I do want to just highlight it. Verse 9. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't that an incredible prayer right there? Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The evil one. Then he continues in verse 14, back with a thought of forgiveness. He says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Wow, that's powerful. So he gives us the priorities of prayer. The first one is intimacy. Focus on God as your Father who desires an active relationship with you. No matter what kind of earthly father you've had, you have a heavenly father who wants a relationship with you. Then he begins the prayer with this idea of worship. Worship. Your name is hallowed. Focus on God's name. Yahweh, the name of God. And there are several names for God. We understand who God is and we celebrate his name. His child should be doing that. His child should be celebrating who he is. That's why we should begin our prayers by worship, worshiping God. Well, God, please give me this. No, we should begin our prayers by worshiping God. Then he gives us the the picture of submission. Your kingdom come, your will be done. It's focus on God's will so that we can presently live in holiness and aspects of heaven can take place here on earth through the fruit of the Spirit, through salvation of souls and all these things, and it's the future kingdom consummation that we're praying for, right? We want to see Jesus come back, don't we? Amen? Like, that's what we want. So there's intimacy in worship and submission to God. These are things that are focused on God. Famous missionary Elizabeth Elliot, she said years ago, to pray thy will be done, I must be willing, if the answer requires it, that my will be undone. And so we pray this. We pray for the will of God. We we pray that God's will be done in intimacy and worship and submission. Now he, he, he continues with this focus on yourself. Requests. Focus on today's needs that God will supply. Now we're going to get into this in a later message in Matthew 6, 25. But in the culture of that day, you have to understand something. Literally, first century workers, they got paid day by day. So if someone got sick and they missed a few days, they could get far behind and it could be devastating to their their livelihood, to their family, all those things. And so when Jesus says here, this request of meet my needs today, this was a powerful illustration of you have to take it one day at a time and trust God for today. Your will be done. God, give us this day our daily bread. Then he talks about forgiveness. Focus on forgiveness brokenness over your sin that produces forgiveness of others. Now, that connects back to Matthew 5, the very beginning of the Sermon of the Mount, right? Blessed are those who are broken in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn over their sin, right? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The person who mourns over their sin, the person who realizes who they are before God, God gives forgiveness and he desires that we give forgiveness. And then the last aspect of it is asking for strength, protection from Temptation that will make the right decisions. These are all the priorities in prayer. And again, we're kind of glossing over it quickly, but it's the right kind of a prayer. And I will tell you this morning, how you pray determines how you view yourself. How you pray determines how you view yourself. There's an incredible illustration that Jesus gives of this in Luke chapter 18. I want you to see this in verse number 9. Where Jesus said this, to some who are confident of their own righteousness. Now that's the issue, right? And they look down on everyone else, which that's the natural reaction to that. If you get to that place in your life where you are confident in your own righteousness or supposed righteousness, you begin to look down upon other people. This is what Jesus is saying. So he tells a parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like this other scumbag. 
I'm not like this other guy, the robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers, or even like this guy, this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all that I get. I'm an incredible guy. But the tax collector who stood at a distance, and I love this, he would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast And he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said this, I tell you that this guy, this man, rather than the other, he is the one that's saved. He is the one that's justified, declared righteous. He is the one that God has really changed on the inside out. He is the guy. You see, the illustration is of the one who says, look at what I've done. I've done this. I've done that. Look how powerful I am. And man, I'm so much better than this loser. And this other guy is like, Lord, I'm not even good enough. I'm not even, God, I can't even look up to heaven. And and Jesus says, "It's, it's that guy. It's that guy. So when we pray, do we focus on who we are and what we've done and what we've accomplished? Or do we give the glory to God? It's a self focus. Let me give you the last illustration Jesus gives it's self attention. Matthew 6 and verse 16. Now he gets into fasting. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Listen, you see that all three times. They've received their reward in full. You know what he's saying? Man, they got the praise of man. That's all they get. Nothing else. No influence, no legacy, no impact, nothing else. That's all they get. They disfigure their faces. Surely I tell you, they've received their word in full. Verse 17. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will be obvious to others that you are fasting. Well, it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Self-attention. Again, be motivated to commitment. He's given this idea without conversation. You don't have to talk about it. I mean, the fact is for us, trying to get people to notice our spirituality, it diminishes our spirituality. Do we understand that? And our prayer lives are to be contained in us and explosive for God based on what God wants to do with it. But they're contained within us What is fasting? What is this? I don't think it's what we think it is. I have this. You've heard me talk about it before. I call it the get unfat plan, okay? For me, where like during the week, I stay away from pop and desserts and all those kinds of things. And on the weekend, I enjoy those things. You say, that's a terrible way to lose weight. I know it is, but I've just told myself it works, okay? It probably, whatever, it doesn't really work. Some of you are on keto and Weight Watchers or whatever. Some of you don't care, but... Fasting is, is not that. It has very little to do with that. Matter of fact, it had everything to do with sacrificing innate desires to focus on selfless prayer. So the, the last section on prayer connects to this section because it often went together. The person who is fasting, they're showing a seriousness of their prayers, and God is pleased, and God often will reward that request. I'm not always, but often he will. We have to understand something. Fasting was something that was mandatory for the Jewish people only once a year in the Day of Atonement. Just one time a year. But the religious leaders, they did it twice a week. Why? Not because their hearts were fixed on God, but because they wanted to draw attention upon themselves. And so Jesus is exposing this hypocritical mentality. He said, man, you, you go and you even change your, your appearance. You put ashes on your head. You walk around unshaven and unclean. Sometimes you don't put the oils that naturally Jews in that day would wear. You don't do that. And you're drawing attention to yourselves. You want everybody to know that you're fasting. He said, listen, that's the wrong mentality. You're doing this the wrong way. You're trying to impress people. It's not really about fasting. It's not really about focusing on God. It's not really about focusing on life change or a prayer request that you want to see God do a miracle. And it's not really about those things. It's really about you and your focus on you. What does Jesus do? He exposes it. This is not real. It's not righteous. It's, it's not the way to live. And for us, we have to understand something that 
When we do fast, I, I find this to be interesting. There are some fasts in the Bible that were public fasts, but often fasting is a private thing. Listen, when you're fasting and you're praying, that's between you and God. Don't announce that. You don't go around and tell, I just want everybody to know I'm, fa- I'm spiritual. I'm fasting and praying. Like, we, we don't, that's, that's the wrong mentality. If you're fasting and praying over something right now, that's between you and God, and you make that a special thing between you and God. And we have to be God-centered in our aim and in our action. What are we, what are we looking to accomplish, right? Our, our hearts often have like mixed motives to honor God. Why? Because of being deluded by the desire of man's praise. So my question for us this morning is, how are we changing the narrative about ourselves? Jesus here, he gives three vivid illustrations, almsgiving or giving to the poor, prayer and fasting, to prove to his disciples that why you do something is just as important as what you're doing. And all three of these illustrations are supposed to be displays of worship, but instead, now listen to this, they had become displays of self. Man's attention, and this is the point that I think, I, if you don't remember anything, I want you to remember this point. Man's attention ends in the moment. God's approval extends beyond our comprehension. When you're seeking man's attention, it ends right there. But when you're seeking God's approval, God extends your influence and your impact in areas that you may not see until you get to heaven, but you can be guaranteed that God is working. Why? Because God is not going to share his glory with you and I. And ultimately, the starvation for man's attention, it leads to an elitist mentality that involves us rejecting others. My question for you this morning is, what is your appetite? What are you hungry for? What really drives you? Is it the glory of God or is it the glory of self? And I will tell you, if it's the glory of God, you will be willing to go unnoticed. I pray this prayer all the time. I tell God, listen, please, I just want you to work. I understand I'm on the stage every week, I preach, but I... I don't want glory. I don't want attention. I want God. I want God to work in this place in such a way where he gets the glory. Because the thing that I've found over the years is that when I try to manufacture results, it's pointless, it's worthless, it's false. But when God is working and God's receiving glory, That's when lives are changed. It's nothing that we do or did. I led this person to Christ. No, you didn't. No. God led that person to God. He's the one who drew that person. You're just being faithful. You're being what you're supposed to be, but you didn't do anything. When I was a youth pastor, kids would say, Pastor John, save me. And we're like, no, I didn't. No. This morning, be legit in your motivations. And it's one of the hardest things for us to do, but take a deep dive right now into not what you're doing, but why you're doing it. That right there is the beginning to God moving and working in ways that we could never even comprehend. Bow your heads with me if you would today. Jesus gives three illustrations, three examples. He was speaking to the crowds. The crowds were inundated with religious, superficial, insincere leaders who were looking out for themselves. And Jesus is teaching the crowds that's not true righteousness. It's the glory of God, not the glory of man. For some of us today, and I know in my own heart I've been challenged deeply with this we need to repent 
of the sin of self to the, to the point of realizing that God, when God is receiving the glory, God's hand, his favor will be upon us and upon this church and upon you and your family in ways that you could never comprehend. But when you and I, when we focus on ourselves, and we do it for the praise of man, oh, we're going to receive the praise of man, but that's where it ends. That is a, a terrifying thing to me personally. Because I just want to see God move and work. Maybe you're here today and God's speaking in your life. Maybe you find yourself acting in the past based on what you're going to receive from it. I pray today that God would move and work in your life in a way that you would honor him. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, today is the day of salvation. After the gathering, I will be here. I will pray with you. I will encourage you. You can cry out to God right now as I've already spoken of. Don't miss the opportunity to be legitimate in your motivations before a holy God. Lord, we love you so much. God, help us to invest in what is real and genuine. God, help us to realize that it's not just what we do, but it's why we do it. We can be doing a lot of things well, at least outwardly, but inwardly be full of all the wrong motivations. God, help us to always look to praise you and give you the glory. The renown of Jesus Christ should be our life's passion. May we never forget this. We love you. For it's in your precious name, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Four things for you as we conclude today. The first, if you have children or grandchildren who are interested in Lake Ann Camp, uh, you can have them sign up. There's a sign-up sheet at the ministry table at the back. We're starting to take registrations for camp now, so make sure to get uh, your, your kids, grandkids in. Spots are filling up quick, so make sure to sign them up. Uh, the second thing, your devotionals are available either on the app or at the Welcome Center week four. Uh, you can go find those there. Uh, I want to remind you also of our Discover Emmanuel class beginning next Sunday. We have an option at 9.30 and 11.15. Uh, you can sign up at the back of the auditorium. Um, that will be in classroom one on uh, next week. And then the final thing is this. We have a Connections Lunch today. If you've been a guest with us the past few weeks, past few months, and you've never been, I encourage you to come. Uh, it's after the 11.15 gathering. But you're welcome to come back and participate in that. Those are all the things that I have. Let's stand together and be dismissed in prayer. Father God, we are grateful for the truth that you spoke to us this morning. And Father, I pray that you would help us to be uh, sincere, help us to be honoring to you in the things that we say, the things that we do. Pray that our in, inner heart, our inner man, would be the same as that which we show on the outside. Father, we pray that you dismiss us with your blessing now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.